watching Reason and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Your host, Michael. We are talking about St. Ephraim and universalism and asking the question, did he, in fact, teach universalism? Joined by Dr. Andrew Hayes in order to uh, answer this question. He is returning uh, to the show. He was previously on about a month ago or so talking about the Eastern Catholic perspective of the book of Genesis. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. Dr. Hayes, welcome back to the show. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here and I'm, uh, I'm doing all right. Doing okay. Yeah. Really, really excited to have you on. I'm, I'm also looking forward to this because I think that um, the question of universalism in the church fathers is something that we hear thrown around pretty often. You even have figures like David Bentley Hart, who we have had on the show, uh, say that, you know, there's a handful of fathers who taught it. So I'm looking forward to finding out if St. Ephraim is among them <laughs> so uh but but before we dive in if you will tell us a little bit about yourself and your um background oh uh sure michael so i am uh, an associate professor of theology at the university of saint thomas in houston and uh i specialize in syriac patristics and saint Ephraim especially but uh some of the other uh, classical syriac authors as well as uh, christian arabic and the uh, relationship between the Quran and early Christianity. So these are some of my research interests, but really I, you can think of me as, uh, as sometimes uh, some of my friends do the Ephraim guy. The Ephraim and, guy. Uh, yeah, I, like and I, 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 since I love Ephraim so much, I think of that as, as a pretty uh, lovely title to have, and uh, uh, I hope I can be worthy of it. So I um, uh, have taught uh, patristics for a long time, published a few things, including a translation of Ephraim's Metrical Discourses on Faith fairly recently. Um, and uh, I also belong to the, the Melkite Church, where I um, serve as a, as a subdeacon in my local parish here. So I have uh, that experience of living the uh, life of, of an Eastern Catholic and, and of having the privilege of being able to study the Eastern Fathers, especially the Syriac ones. Awesome. Well, thank you for that introduction. And like I said, I'm looking forward to it. So what I'll do is I will get out of the way. Um, I'll come back whenever you're ready. I'll be here, of course, eavesdropping. But uh, when, whenever you're ready for me to come back on the screen, let me know and we will take questions then. So everybody hold off in your questions. You're welcome to comment, of course, in the live chat section. But uh, hold off on the questions until towards the end. And I'll, I'll notify everybody when you can start putting in your, your questions. Um, at that time, you'll just make sure to send them to at a reason in theology so I can distinguish them from comments. All right, Dr. Hayes, turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much. So um, this uh, this evening, I'm going to uh, uh, first set the question up a little bit uh, and kind of introduce St. Ephraim in that way. And then I intend to uh, look briefly at two aspects of his, his poetics, the poetics of the furnace and the poetics of the chasm. Both of these are biblical images through which he expresses his uh, his approach to this question. Okay. And uh, so that'll be the overall structure. And if you're not too familiar with St. Ephraim the Syrian, it's helpful to know from the outset that eschatological themes figure very prominently in his poetry and his prose. Ephraim himself lived in the fourth century. The conventional dates of his life are approximately 306 to the year 373, which makes him an exact contemporary of St. Athanasius. And he, his uh, hymns on paradise, in particular, explore many aspects of eschatology depicted from a rich palette of symbols that are collected out of nature, scripture, and Jewish tradition. And he also devotes an entire work, the prose letter to Publius, to a meditation on the last judgment. So in, in these two works and others, the Syrian doctor reflects especially on Sheol, uh, paradise and Gehenna. They're not all the same thing. And he often turns to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus for uh, inspiration. That's from Luke 16. And other works, especially his Carmen and Nisibina, or Nisibine hymns, as they're sometimes called, reflect on the fate of sin and death and Satan in highly imaginative and um, 
dramatic dialogues, especially insofar as Christ's descent to the dead pre <coughs> excuse me, presages their ultimate downfall, the downfall, that is, of sin and death and Satan. Ephraim's symbolic vision typically, though not always, distinguishes between Sheol, which is the this-worldly abode of the dead prior to the final resurrection of the body, Gehenna, which is for him the currently empty eschatological place of fiery torment, and Paradise, the multi-tiered luminous height that forms the abode of the righteous according to their merits. In uh, 2013, the eminent scholar Ilaria Ramelli has, uh, wrote a book that insisted that in such reflections, Ephraim implicitly endorses the doctrine of apocatastasis, the ultimate salvation of all human beings by Christ. And she claims that he, like other universalists, hold this view as a solution to the problem of evil in which God's ultimate victory over sin and evil appears precisely in sinners' complete restoration, including their final rescue from hell. And as Ramelli reads Ephraim, it is not that no one enters hell or Gehenna, but rather that all humans eventually escape it via repentance and the mercy of Christ. So on this account, the punishment of Gehenna would be real, but not permanent. So, so there's some nuance to how she presents Ephraim as a universalist. She argues her point in a number of ways, uh, but above all, she emphasizes the totality of Christ's victory. And here I quote her, she says, quote, not only over death, but also over hell, not only over Sheol, but also over the devil, views which, she says, she continues, come very close to a universalistic perspective and constitute at least important premises to the doctrine of apocatastasis. So you can see right there that she's uh, not willing to put him fully uh, as an explicit uh, universalist, but she thinks that he's um, uh, in that trajectory. And she also points to Ephraim's putative allowance for post-mortem repentance. This is a really interesting feature of Ephraim's thought. Here's what she says about this. And she has her citations to certain passages in Ephraim as she goes. She says, one cannot repent before the resurrection in Sheol, but everyone can, she claims, after the resurrection in Gehenna. For in Gehenna, all human beings keep their free will, which is a gift from God, and thus and will thus be able to repent. And this is why Ephraim foresees that in the end, Gehenna will become empty. Like Origen, Ephraim insists that this will be an effect of God's grace. And most of her passages here come from the Carmen and Nisibina. Uh, she also quotes the, the commentary on the Deity Sarum. So Romelli's arguments rest principally on two features of Ephraim's thought. First, his emphasis on the total character of Christ's victory, and second, his emphasis on free will and repentance. And so with reference to the first feature of his thought, she also adds this, that Christ's victory over Sheol is eschatological, and she, she, she claims that Ephraim does not always distinguish between Sheol and Gehenna, and thus, she thinks, Ephraim implies universal salvation by holding to the universal resurrection from Sheol. So she kind of exploits... Uh, uh, an ambiguity in Ephraim's thought, and, and like many authors, uh, there are several of these. And so she thinks that you can reasonably draw this, this conclusion from, um, from these, these uh, pieces of his thought. So Romelli's arguments regarding Ephraim, it's important to point out, form but a small portion of her vast and erudite study of apocatastasis in the early church. That book is, I think, something like 800 pages long. She gives 30 pages to Ephraim. I, I make no claim here to try to address her whole argument. It wouldn't be possible in this format anyway. But my goal is just to answer two relatively modest questions in this regard. So we're using Romelli's claim as kind of a way to, as a way to pose the question. And my, the, my two questions that I want to, to try to answer in this talk are first, whether her interpretation of Ephraim is accurate. And second, whether more positively, one might learn something of Ephraim's theological resolution 
uh, learn something of Ephraim's theological resolution for the problem of evil by careful attention to the poetic technique and the imagery in which he couches his eschatological meditations. And so um, I'm going to answer both questions at once. I, to start with, I argue that Romelli has overstated and misstated the case for universalism in Ephraim. And in doing so, I think she has missed his preferred solution, which is the concept of impartial just punishment. His poetic appeal to the heart as a furnace that transmutes experiences and his poetic appeal to the unbridgeable chasm between the rich man and Lazarus disclose, I think, a mystery richer and more balanced than universalism. Whatever one may make of Ephraim's bolder speculations about the possibility of post-mortem repentance. And those are present in his thought, just to be clear. Indeed, this richer disclosure, I think, encompasses three distinct argumentative angles or perspectives. The first is the concept of the second death. The second is the poetics of the symbol of the furnace. And the last is the, the poetics of the symbol of the chasm. So I want to talk first about the notion of second death, because I think this helps us um, helps us respond in, an, in a preliminary way to Rome. Romelli's claims. So clear evidence for the definitive character of the punishment of the damned does appear in Ephraim's writings. And we see this especially in his allusions to the second death, Malta Tenyana. Um, in one instance, he refers to the uh, baptismal mark of the cross. This is from Carmen and Nisibina 73.8. He simply says this, mark your dead with the cross that they might have victory over the second death. And Romelli actually deals with this phrase, or this, uh, or the, this phrase, second death, in her vast study. When she encounters this phrase in other authors, she argues that it refers to the death of death, that is, to, to death's ultimate destruction. And I, it certainly could very well refer to that in certain other authors. But here in Ephraim, this cannot be the case. For if so, there would be no sense in his speaking of aspiring to victory over the second death. Right? If death is the death of death, you, you want that to happen. The second death is the death of death. You actually want that to happen. You don't want victory over it. Um, so what he's, what he's talking about instead is a post-resurrection death. A post-resurrection death. And thus he also distinguishes between resurrection and salvation. And one of the things that he does, in fact, is contrast this second death with how natural death, which is what he actually calls it by a different name, he calls it natural repose, shenta davkiana. He contrasts that natural repose for the faithful ascetic Christian, uh, and says that that is in fact a welcome respite from labor and a delightful sleep. Even he calls it a friend. So uh, from one perspective, dying is is good, right? Um, but the polarity between that natural death, which he thinks, for the, at least for those who are faithful ascetic Christians, he thinks that that's a good thing. It's a, it's a respite from labor, a delightful sleep, a friend. The polarity between that and the second death is clearly a contrastive one. And so in Carmen and Nisibana, uh, Carmen Nisibana 43, 15, he says this. It's very simple and it's uh, perfectly clear. The second death has no escape. The second death has no escape. He's unambiguous on this point. Physical resurrection puts an end to natural death. That's clear. The second death is clearly of another sort, something ultimately final that is beyond the body's resurrection. And in the hymns on paradise, Ephraim contrasts the reward of the righteous and the punishment of the wicked. He concludes the polarity between these two. So he's talking about the reward of the righteous, again, in terms very similar to the Carmen and the Sabina. Uh, but then, he, so he does the same thing. He talks about the reward of the righteous, then he talks about the punishment of the wicked, and he says, he concludes that polarity simply by saying this, as for their punishment, it does not end. Uh, the phrase in Syriac, wa la ghamar, it, it does not end. It does not reach a conclusion. And uh, I, I think this is kind of helpful to point out because Ephraim is uh, somewhat innocent of the debates over Greek terminology for this. It's, uh, he doesn't appear to have known very much Greek and his theology is not conducted in Greek. That doesn't mean he's ignorant of Greek thought, far from that. But it, it, it does mean that he, he's got a way of saying things which gives us an alternative angle of vision linguistically. And that can be, I think, particularly helpful for this very fraught discussion. 
So, so this is Ephraim's eschatology that I've just described, talking about the second death. But it turns out that Ephraim's protology supports the same conclusion as his eschatology. His commentary on Genesis discusses at length the real possibility of permanent torment as the very reason why God removed Adam and Eve from the tree of life. So this is in his commentary on Genesis, um, where he's talking about why it is that Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden after their fall. And he says this, from the one, namely the tree of knowledge, they got temporal sufferings. But the other, namely the tree of life, would have turned temporary sufferings eternal. From the one they obtained death, which frees them from the bonds of their sufferings. But this one, namely the tree of life, would have made them buried while still alive. It would have left them eternally tormented by their pains, he says. So I think this is a pretty explicit, it's also probably a late, later work of his, it certainly comes after the Madrashe on Paradise because he refers to the Madrashe on Paradise in his commentary on Genesis. Um, and and he's, he's pretty clear about this. Mere physical life, including bodily resurrection, is not to be identified with salvation. They're not the same thing. This life buried alive doubtless is what Ephraim means by the second death. For Ephraim, resurrection is universal. Beatitude, not necessarily so. And the possibility of one without the other is real enough that God must take concrete steps to avert it, not by changing its reality, but by warding Adam and Eve off from it. And so from this, I think it's pretty clear that Ephraim certainly did not intend his statements that Christ grants life and resurrection to all as necessarily implying final ultimate restoration. So this is sort of my, my, my first uh, first line of argument against Romelli's view. I think we can find evidence in Ephraim's texts that clearly goes against it, right? But that doesn't tell us what he did intend. So we might have to, so is that, we, we have to ask ourselves more positively, what, what did he intend by talking about Christ granting life and resurrection to all and things like the second death? And what, what, is, what is his own account of this more, more, more broadly? And so for that, I think we can turn to the poetics of the furnace first. Because one of Ephraim's favorite images is the smelting furnace, which he values for its ability to express the notion of discrimination, separation, and transformation. And here's the thing. You might think, oh, furnace, Gehenna, right? No. What's the furnace for Ephraim? It's paradise. Um, and um, so... He applies the image not to Gehenna, but to paradise itself, which discriminates among the achievements of the righteous, as well as between the righteous and the wicked. Paradise was, in fact, a furnace from the beginning. It was a furnace for Adam. Here's what he says in him on Paradise 6. I became like one I was not, for paradise renewed me with its transformations. I swam around in its waves of glory. The region that, like an ardent furnace, stripped Adam naked, in that very place, I was so intoxicated that I forgot my debts, or, or I forgot my sins. So elsewhere in the hymns on paradise, Ephraim makes clear that paradise is intoxicating waves that he was just talking about a moment ago, the ones that he's swimming around in, are waves of divine glory light, which serve the inhabitants of paradise as both food and drink. He calls them pastures of visions, and intoxicating waves of glory that flow down from the beauty of that fair essence. That's from the ninth hymn on paradise. So here he imagines paradise as a vessel filled with this blessed and fiery experience. And the effect of the paradise furnace depends on what has been put into it. He, he, he shows this in many places. One, for example, a hymn on paradise number four, he talks about Adam, after his sin, it's as if a corpse had been cast into a sea of life. And what does that sea of life do? It spits him out. So, the, but the, the key thing to recognize here is that the furnace itself is not evil, but it is rather an abundant vehemence of radiant goodness, which separates the good from the bad or transforms the lower into the higher. And Ephraim also interiorizes the furnace image. 
so that it expresses the problem with the sinful human heart. In him on the church, number one, uh, he, he structures that poem according to three sorts of stanzas. Some of them are supplications to God. Some of them are self-reproof. Some of them are exhortations to the audience. This is sort of a cycle of supplication, self-examination, exhortation. And the stanzas of supplication themselves, supplicating God, form a kind of pattern of imagery. All of them take the same theme. They all revolve around vessels of fire and the notion of eating. And they all are associative. They're all actually linking God with man. So this furnace imagery is about bringing God and man together. So here's here's one example from uh, the very first verse of the um, first hymn on the church. Increase, Lord, he says, our discrimination for debts or sins have suffocated our discrimination. So we've lost our ability to, to discern. Right? From earth, Lord, you fashioned us and on earth our heart feeds and as often as you raise up our heart to the watcher's presence, that's to say the presence of the angels, it hurries to descend to the depth into snares. Create us anew, O Lord, as vessels for your teshbohta, for your praise, for your glory, which is, of course, also the, the, the characteristic, the signature characteristic of paradise. So what he's saying here is that the heart that feeds on earth becomes a vessel for earth rather than for the glory food described in hymns on paradise, and thus it loses its capacity to discriminate. So by contrast, divine fire tries the three youths in the fiery furnace, that story from Daniel. Here's what he says about this in another hymn on the church, or a little, little bit later in the same hymn, excuse me. The fire, he says, loosened the bonds of the three, and they rejoiced and confessed God. Our Lord left his fire on earth, in order that it might dissolve our bonds. So it's not an experience that just the three youths have. It's somehow available to us. He doesn't say how or where exactly, but here's what he does say. And sweet in our mouth is the taste of bitterness. Our delight binds us. Our torment frees us. Free, Lord, those who are bound, even if the bonds are beloved to us. So what's that from saying here? He prays to God that we might be delivered from bad taste. That is, from the inability to taste things as they truly are. Precisely to the extent that we are sinful, we experience things in reverse. The furnace of our discrimination, you might say, fails. So Ephraim turns in the end of the, the same hymn to a prayer for healing. Heal, he says, Lord. Heal, Lord, the mouth of the heart. May it become a furnace for tastes. The tastes of debt are sweet and those of the commandments are pungent. The great wonder is that a change occurs for both at the same time. The sweetness of debt changes to bitterness and the pungency of the commandments becomes a delight. May your love, Lord, become a furnace for our affairs. So as a furnace, the vessel of the heart tries perceptions or tastes. And Ephraim simply prays that divine love might serve as the fire to purify the heart, whose real food should be as the first stanza suggests and the hymns on paradise generally confirm whose real food should be the glory of God. The alternative Ephraim implies is that the heart should experience what is good as if it were evil. And this is precisely how he characterizes the vision that the wicked have of paradise from across the unbridgeable chasm separating the rich man from Lazarus in the epistle to, or the letter to Publius. So now we can turn to the poetics of the chasm and the melody of just punishment, according to Ephraim. So Ephraim's prose letter to Publius is a really fascinating work. It's a lyrical work. It's marked by anaphoric series, parallel cola, chiasm. The prologue, for example, just to take one example that we're going to look at, uh, comprises a sequence of syntactically uniform cola whose images form a series of 23 thematic units. And those units are clustered around a five-element center at the heart of which is an admonition. So it's a, whole, a giant chiasm and right in the smack dab in the middle of that chiasm is an admonition. And that admonition is presented in terms of mirror imagery, which is kind of cool when you think about it because the chiasm itself, the very structure of a chiasm is mirror-like, right? Because it's the one piece of, of the text is the inverse of the other or the, or the, the reflection of the other, you might say. Um, so uh, this mirror imagery, what is he doing with it? Well, just as a natural mirror reflects the beauty or the ugliness of whatever is placed in front of it while remaining itself the same, so too the mirror of the gospel has the power to reflect all character types, whether ugly or beautiful, while preserving its nature unaffected. Here's what he says. 
quote, it rebukes the ugly with their faults that they might heal themselves and abolish blackness from their faces and preaches to the beautiful that they take care with their beauties, lest they be spotted with defilement, that they increase them with the adornments of will added to the nature of their creation. It would be hard to get a more succinct um, description for Ephraim of what he thinks the, the spiritual life is about. It's a, you know, we have a beauty from creation, which we adorn through our actions. And so we, we have, we have kind of a second nature or second adornment. Um, but by making this the central and thus the focal section of his prologue, Ephraim, contrary to what one might expect, he actually associates, he joins together rather than separating the righteous and the wicked. Because both the righteous and the wicked readers of the gospel find themselves in precisely the same intermediate position, poised between two outcomes. He focuses on what they have in common rather than on what divides them. And this is because they face one and the same impartial judge as changeless as the mirror. Indeed, Ephraim is so concerned to emphasize the mirror's changeless unity, despite the multiplicity of outcomes, that he repeats this assertion three times in the prologue, just to make sure we get the point. The mirror depicts all different sorts of colors or members. In other words, human sin does not alter God. The righteous and the wicked experience the same thing, albeit very differently. They are, after all, looking in the same divine mirror. And you might think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't you say the mirror was the gospel? Yes, I did. But does the mirror of the gospel for Ephraim also represent God? Yes, it does. For Ephraim goes on to say that the evangelical mirror is itself but the shadow of, quote, the supernal, unfading beauty by which all the sins of creation are rebuked and by which is bestowed the recompense for all those who preserve their beauties unspattered by mire. That supernal, unfailing beauty. It's the same language that you get in the hymns on paradise. It's God. It's the divine beauty. So the gospel mirror itself is but an image of the tranquil divine beauty, one and the same and undivided, meeting out diverse consequences despite its simple and unchanging character. Now, when one in his meditation on the on the on the uh, last judgment, when one arrives at this chasm, as described in Luke 16, Ephraim employs it both for the reversal of experience that we saw with the furnace and also for the notion of just punishment. Here's what he says, quote, the voice of Abraham, like a swift ambassador, flies on swift wings above the fearful chasm placed as a boundary between the good and the wicked. And this voice, like an ambassador, he goes on to say, delivers, quote, a letter of justice in which are written down these melodious tones of just judgment. This voice, but no comfort, can fly across the unbridgeable chasm. But how is this just torment or just judgment, this dina kena, as he calls it, understood? A clue appears in Ephraim's language of melody and in his mixing of metaphors. For the melody is heard, paradoxically, by being written down. And this just judgment is described not in terms of pain or ugliness, but in terms of a beautiful and soft melody, echoing Ephraim's consistent portrayal of divine beauty. And it's important to know, by the way, that in many cases where Ephraim describes eschatological realities, he, he does this mingling of the metaphors, visual and oral together, or he mingling of sensations. He does this um, elsewhere in the epistle uh, to Publius. He does it in the hymns on paradise in many places. And in fact, the next time Ephraim uses the imagery of flying over that chasm, he refers to the vision of those in Gehenna. And there again, what is it that they see? They see a song embodied. Here's what he says. This is paragraph 21 of the letter to Publius. The vision of their eyes causes them pain insofar as in stretching out to the boundary of the chasm, it crosses over it swiftly and flies to the paradise of Eden and hovers over the paradise of God and sees the blessed banquet and longs for the tables of the kingdom and hears the voice of pure songs combined with chaste chants, interwoven with the praises of God, entwining the height with their extent, opening up the gates of the kingdom, hovering with joy before their Lord, imparting one to another the single voice of their mouth. There's no evil in what the wicked see from across the chasm, 
Indeed, what they see is the liturgy of paradise, a, if you may, uh, if you'll permit it, a visio melodica that they behold, whose ineffability is implied by the mingling of oral and visual metaphors. But for the wicked, this very beauty causes pain. Their just torment, as Ephraim presents it, is something good and beautiful for those who have eyes to see it correctly. And in the very next section of the letter to Publius, Ephraim even points out that the oral and visual symbols are simply there to tell us that, quote, perhaps the Gehenna of the wicked is what they see. So all that imagery, he sort of condenses it down to that assertion. Perhaps the Gehenna of the wicked is what they see. He goes on to say that there is not literally a right hand or a left hand there, or some of the other images that are described. He knows that these are symbols. And he's explicit about that. The chasm, one may therefore infer, serves to express the polar opposite experiences of one and the same reality. And in fact, the reversal works both ways. Here's what he says. Quote, there the vision of the eyes is permitted both to go and to come. To both sides, it gives pain or joy insofar as the lot of the blessed increases in their eyes when they see the wicked and they rejoice over it. And insofar as in the eyes of the wicked, it brings them lower, their pain is increased for them. The chasm separates compassion, but not vision, even as it reverses the consequences of vision. So the joy of the righteous increases at the sight of the wicked, and the affliction of the wicked increases at, the, at that of the righteous. Indeed, the mirror itself, quote, mocks the ugly. Mocks. Magahaka. Lasnaya. In the hymns on paradise, Ephraim takes up again the chasm between the rich man and Lazarus, and there... The son, the Abraham and the son's light are, quote, without mercy. They, too, mock their persecutors. And not without irony, Ephraim employs the, the, the word for mock. It's, it's mahalin, which in one form means to mock or deride. But in another form, it means to sing praise. The same root forms the base of the word hallelujah, mahalin. Right? So it is as if the heavenly praises that the righteous sing are the very mockery that they utter. The word choice reflects the reversal that Ephraim finds symbolized in the chasm, the opposite effects of the same reality. For he goes on to point out, and this is him on Paradise 1, that the chasm cuts off the love which would mediate so that the love of the righteous is not bound to the wicked, lest the good be tortured when they see in Gehenna their sons and their brethren and their families. So the chasm represents for Ephraim a boundary self-inflicted which compassion cannot cross. It reverses expectations, even family ties. And therein lies the difficulty for us, Ephraim implies. It is because we do not see straight and we do not discriminate rightly that we are inclined to see the punishments of the wicked in Gehenna as an evil. Ephraim, by cultivating this paradox, wishes to stir our complacency and wishes to invite a conversion that will reignite the furnace of our discrimination, lest we be like those who, in Ephraim's own words, quote, have cut off their own hope by doing evil. So Ephraim regards the final punishment of sinners in Gehenna clearly as definitive, a mode of existence like life buried alive. But that does not leave Ephraim at odds with himself when he emphasizes the totality of Christ's victory over Satan, death, shale, sin, and evil, because the punishment of the wicked is itself good. Evil does not ultimately triumph. This punishment is perceived by the wicked as evil, and hence they are tormented. But the vision of God's radiant goodness remains ever the same, unchanging, simple, and good. This single vision of God's glory is food for the righteous and fire for the wicked. If we may put it boldly, God does not inflict evil on sinners, but rather inflicts good on them. So Ephraim, I argue, has no need for apocatastasis to ensure that God triumphs in the end. Rather, as his poetry makes clear, his real concern is with the reversal of experience, and he draws attention to it so that we might supplicate the divine benevolence in order to behold the divine glory according to its true delight, that it may prove to be a purifying and transformative furnace rather than a source of pain and remorse, so that it might turn out to be for us a furnace rather than a chasm. And Ephraim focuses on the chasm as that balancing point of the paradox, the balancing point where the eye of the mind has the opportunity to gaze on both sides. 
And that, in fact, is a signature of Ephraim's thought, his love for balance. He tends to eschew simple definitions and prefers instead to hold poles and complementary dialectical tension with one another. And certainly in the case of Gehenna and Paradise, one and the same reality, which is the divine glory light, exhibits two distinct characteristics in harmonious but opposing balance, just punishment for the wicked and intoxicating joy for the righteous. So Ephraim does hope, it's important to point out, for some form of purgation and some sort of intermediate state after the resurrection. He expresses that hope a few different places, but he himself never advocates for the final emptiness of Gehenna for he has no need to do so. There's no, no, no logic within his thinking that would compel that. Evil does not somehow win if the wicked remain there. Rather, he construes their presence there as a good thing. And it can only be our, it can be, uh, only be our warped perception of things that does not in fact find our joy increased by the justice of divine punishment, its sweet and melodious notes as Ephraim calls them. Indeed, the sins of creation do not harm the creator they do not cross over to him to take away from his glorious blessedness or from the blessedness of those whom he has found worthy of his glory. So that's what I think Ephraim thinks about universal salvation. Wow, um, fascinating stuff. Okay, so um, and by the way, go ahead, and everybody, and send your chat questions. Make sure to send them to at Reason and Theology. Um, so I, I have a couple questions. It's it sounds like you're saying that Ephraim thinks that if we're looking at things properly, those who are in perdition, um, this isn't something that we would grieve over. In fact, we would see this as good, even if it's family members. Yep, that's what he says. It's a bold claim. And I, susp I suspect that some people would just throw up their hands in disbelief and totally reject Ephraim from this point onward. But um, right. It reminds me of Aquinas and in, in, in his perspective here. But okay, so you know, I, I know it's a little hard to speculate. But is there anything in his uh, writings that would indicate what he would say in response to those who think, "Oh, well, you're a monster taking pleasure in the joy of the sufferings of others"? Well, um, I, I don't find him uh, particularly troubled by this, but I think that that's because that objection that you just described is um, most likely, it arises uh, out of our own context and not one that um, would have uh, been prominent in his own. Um, I think that um, I think that the issue is that our view of what is good and evil is warped. And he, he basically says this. And so um, uh, this really is at the heart of the problem. If you have a certain view of good and evil, Right, then you will um, be pushed in the direction of, of universalism, perhaps. If you can't regard punishment, just punishment, as good, then okay. there's no way you can actually accept the position that he uh, takes. I think I really do think he, there are two alternatives. There's either Ephraim's view or there's the universalist view. And there's some shared space between them um, in the sense that you can, um, you can have certain speculations or hopes, right? But um, to the extent that a universalist is a hardcore universalist and rejects the notion of just punishment as uh, at least as a permanent reality, um, then I, I think that's where the, the dividing line lies. So I, I think I, I don't I can't think of any place in Ephraim's writings where he would um, where he addresses the sort of moral monster objection because he doesn't see it as an objection. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think he would understand it. I think he would perhaps view that as um, conflating uh pain with evil um, okay. yeah um so what is it that some figures are seeing in ephraim that makes them think universalism and apocatastasis and and is it that they're just not being careful uh students of of, of ephraim kind of overlooking the material that you've noted well i it's hard to know for certain um I, I certainly don't wish to impugn the scholarship of those who have studied these, these matters. Sure. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I think that Ephraim is, Ephraim's writings are a, a vast sea, uh, and, uh, that one may, um, uh, one may swim in them all one's life without exhausting them. So it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see the passages that I have brought up being quoted. Okay. In, uh, in some of these arguments, like I didn't find them, for example, in Elaria Romelli. I don't find uh, David Bentley Hart dealing with Ephraim at all. Um, and 
uh, it, it could just be that Ephraim is some in something of an academic ghetto only because not as many people read Syriac, and even those that do uh, don't aren't aren't particularly conversant with Ephraim. And a lot of people who are Ephraim scholars are interested in other matters. So I, I honestly think that we'll eventually get to the point where there's a more robust scholarly conversation on this. It's just that there just aren't very many seriousists out there working on these these issues. Um, and and it's it, it's clear that Ephraim does have universalist sympathies insofar as he's he does envision the possibility of postmortem repentance, at least as a as an aspiration. Um, so. Um, it's just a question of then, okay, is there a point at which that goes away? Or is it just an attention in his thought? My sense is that his definitive view is that just punishment is eventually permanent. Um, and he's just hoping for a grace period. Um, By the way, thank you, Josh, for your super sticker there. I, I, uh, I, I do appreciate that. Um, there is a question here from Joachim. In your view... Does the poetic nature of Ephraim's works not leave the matter open? Um, that's uh, yeah, kind of an expected sort of question. I think a lot of people who aren't accustomed to doing theology through poetry think of it as an imprecise medium, mm -hmm. as a medium that uh, leaves open spaces. Um, I think that is to uh, impose on Ephraim Western categories, assuming that you cannot be precise in poetry. Um, but I, I do think it has a point, the objection has a point. I don't mean totally to dismiss it. There are things that Ephraim deliberately leaves open. So I, I think that um, uh, what we want to do in this case is uh, learn to be good readers of Ephraim. But uh, for those who belong to the Byzantine uh, Catholic tradition, you'll be, or Byzantine generally, Orthodox Catholic, whatever, you'll know that a lot of our liturgical poetry can be quite doctrinally precise when it has to be. And, and I think Ephraim, of course, he's in the fourth century. So there's certain certain subtleties, certain precisions that simply aren't going to be in the cards. But when he needs to be clear, um, he's quite good at it, I think. And I, I think that the challenge is really in learning to read him well. Um, but that challenge is not unique to Ephraim. It's just that um, there are fewer people with a lot of practice reading him than, say, readers of, of Basil or Gregory or, or people or Origen even. So um, I, I think the simple answer is, uh, it's not due to the poetic character of Ephraim's thought that he leaves certain matters open, but if he does leave them open, it's because either he doesn't consider things or because he deliberately leaves things open. When he wants to, when he wants to make a claim, he he does, and mm -hmm. and and good re a good reading of his poetry can can find it. it. I think actually a good analogy to this is Saint Athanasius. Athena uh, uh, Father Khaled Anatolios uh, argues that Athanasius's theology is very dialectical. And so in order to understand it, you have to see it in that light. I think I think something very similar is true of, of Ephraim. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we just got to, we have to read it the right way. But I don't think that that means that he's therefore uh, loosey-goosey with, mm -hmm. with his theology. And I see another super sticker there from Josh. Thank you so much for that. Roberto is asking, are there other church fathers with a similar view as St. Ephraim? Also, why do you think other views are more prevalent? Hmm. Well, um, other fathers with a view, like, like I guess referring to the notion of just punishment. Um, I, I mean, I think that there are, but I myself um, would hesitate to say things about the Western fathers because it's beyond my area of, of expertise. Uh, and that, that's a vast um, field where one could easily um, say something false without meaning to. Um, Ephraim is probably most like some of the other uh, the 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 uh, Greek fathers, um, and uh, uh, I think he's a lot like Gregory of Nyssa, who who whom some people do regard as an explicit universalist, um, and uh, I think Ephraim's also like Pseudo Dionysius in certain ways, although there's no eschatological questions that come up in that corpus really that I know of. So um, Ephraim, I, I think Ephraim would find other um, uh, other. Uh, uh, adherence to his views, but um, it it's also the case that certain people within the Ephraimian tradition do go fully universalist. Isaac of Nineveh is a good example. So what I, I think what this means is that it's a difficult theological question and one for which we don't necessarily have um, uh, the full perspective on it. 
because there are certain things which are simply uh, left to divine mystery. So I think this is why you have people like Isaac, who is clearly a son of Ephraim's thought, uh, going in a universalist direction. And Ephraim himself, I don't think he does it. But I, th I think that there's enough tension in Ephraim that um, one could uh, take a stand. So um, probably, though, uh, it, I think the other people who would be most like Ephraim would be in, in the Alexandrian tradition, Athanasius. Um, and I put the Cappadocians with the Alexandrians as well. Um, obviously, okay. origin is an interesting question, but there's some debate about what exactly origin held also. So, um, um, I'm, I'm just curious, have, have you looked into um, St. Maximus on this issue by any chance? Not on this one in particular. Um, okay. I know that he's often brought up as a, as a sort of quasi-universalist or someone who maybe a closet universalist. Uh, David Bentley Hart certainly puts him in the list with Isaac and Gregory. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, and also, just to be clear, this interesting little tidbit, in the Syriac life of Maximus the Confessor, which is actually a, a, um, an, an anti-hagiography, uh, it, was, it was written against him, he, he's actually accused of being an originist there as well. So his opponent, Maximus's opponents certainly thought of him as an originist. And they're and a universal what, what they meant by that was a universalist. Um and so I I just I don't know at Maximus well enough to be certain one way or the other. Um it's possible. There are universalists among the fathers, or there are people with universalist sympathies among the fathers. And I and and Maximus seems like he he could be one. Uh, but I'd have to leave that to the real experts on Maximus to to say. I wouldn't be surprised if he were. Um mm -hmm. Or, if, or at least if he had very strong universalist um, uh, tendencies. Mm. I certainly think Isaac is. Isaac of Neva. I mean, there's some things that he says that are pretty clear. Uh, um, so uh, I just have to think that Isaac's, I guess, I, I would say probably wrong about those things, <laughs> about that, <laughs> in those assertions. But um, but I, it is a point for debate. It's not, it's not like cut and dry. All the tradition says one thing, you know. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. I think we cleared out all of the questions there. Go ahead and put in a plug for your work. Oh, uh, okay. Well, um, I, um, uh, I'll just say this, I guess, um, if you, if you like what I've done here, uh, you may uh, find it enjoyable to go check out an, uh, a talk that I gave at Lumen Christi and, uh, uh, not too long ago, and it's preserved by the internet on, on YouTube. Um, and, uh, uh, right now, I'm actually working on um, um, uh, the hymns on Paradise 13 and 14 and trying to do more of uh, this um, um, analysis of the poetic features and what that can help, how that can help us become good readers of Ephraim. So um, anybody who has a real interest is, you, I encourage you to just check out my academia profile on academia.edu because that's where I post things that I've been doing. And um, I have a few articles up there and uh, and so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm currently working on. And you're welcome to check things out if you're, if you have further interests, but above all else, just read Ephraim. <laughs> can't go wrong with that. Right. <laughs> I, I think you can't. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much once again for coming on and taking your time out to go over this with us. I, I, I learned a lot and I know everyone in the audience did as well. So we're, we're truly grateful. Thank you. My pleasure. And everybody, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason to theology, or hit the join button here on the channel to become a member, and you'll get access to extra content, and it also helps support what we're doing here. All right, that's going to do it. I'll see you all later. God bless. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? The truth is, many of us spend our lives running from distraction to distraction. And even for dedicated Catholics, our quest for sainthood often takes a back seat. The Saint Maker is the first high performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. Combining the practices of Catholic faithful throughout time with the science of personal productivity, the Saint Maker will help you grow in virtue and structure your spiritual life while getting organized and achieving ambitious goals. And that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is a beautiful, easy to carry, and well crafted companion to your Missal, Bible, and Rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal setting pages, confession journals, and much more. 
There are lots of great Catholics using the Saint Maker, like Scott Williams, CEO of Sock Religious, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Dina Barca and Amber Schneider, and priests like Father Dean Marshall and Father Corey Stika. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. Visit thesaintmaker.com to shop the planners. Quantities are limited, so head over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and start your Saint Maker journey today.